Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the annual Herbert L. Bernstein Memorial Lecture in Comparative Law. The lecture was founded in 2002 to honor the late Herbert Bernstein, who was professor of law here at Duke Law School from 1984 to 2001. Born in Hamburg, Germany on January 12, 1930, Professor Bernstein, who had Jewish heritage on his father's side, grew up in the shadow of Hitler's regime, but he survived both Nazi persecution and the Allied bombing of his hometown and went on to study law at the University of Hamburg after the war had ended. After graduating and while practicing law in Hamburg, Bernstein was elected to the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and Private International Law. He also continued his studies at the University of Hamburg, earning his doctorate in law and graduating magna cum laude in 1962. Later that very same year, he moved to the United States and earned his JD at the University of Michigan, again, magna cum laude. He joined Duke Law School as a faculty member in 1984 and taught contracts, comparative law, private international law, and European Union law. On the occasion of his sudden passing in 2001, Dean Kate Bartlett said, he was a man of extraordinary erudition, warmth, and humanity. We are grateful for the privilege of having known such a wonderful man. And a few years later, Professor Paul Hagen wrote, he was funny, irreverent, and insatiably curious about nearly everything. We are honored today to be joined by Professor Bernstein's wife, uh, uh, Waltraud Bernstein. The Bernstein Lecture was established in 2002 to honor Professor Bernstein's contributions to Duke Law School and to the field of international and comparative law. The lecture has been filled by a long line of very prominent and distinguished speakers, including internationally renowned experts in their fields, such as the deans of Peking University and the Bucerius Law School, legal scholar and novelist Bernhard Schlink, Professor Bernstein's friend and co-author, Joseph Lukowski, Duke's own Donald Horowitz and Ralph Michaels, and most recently, Israeli Supreme Court Justice Daphne Baraka Rez. I'm very pleased to introduce one of our previous Bernstein lecturers, our very own Arthur Larson Professor of Law, Ralph Michaels, who will introduce our guest this year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Welcome, Waltraud, Chief Justice, everybody. This is um, moving for me to hear that Herbert Bernstein had been here from 1984 to 2001, because I had thought he had been here forever, as we think of everyone who comes before us. And I realized that next year it will have been 17 years that I will have been here myself in comparative law. So in that sense, this makes me remember even more how much I came here as a successor to Herbert Bernstein, whom I never met personally, but whom several people here confused uh, me for. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly to my benefit. I will cut short my uh, introductory remarks because Chief Justice Menon has a lot to say, as I just learned, so I will not um, say all the wonderful things that he has achieved. You find some of them on this sheet, although my formulation was infinitely wittier and more <laughs> exciting. I will only say one additional aspect that makes this particular be exciting. We see exciting developments in Asia, in Asian law in general, and in Singapore in particular. Singapore has become, over the last decade or so, a real hub, maybe more, a real hub of international commercial law international commercial arbitration, and a center of an emerging uh, convergence of laws in Asian, and a kind of infra-Asian comparative law that did not exist so much previously. Comparative law used to be the comparison of Asian laws with European or American law, and Asia was very much viewed both in Asia and in the West as a recipient of wisdom and law from the West. One of the exciting things of these times today, and uh, Chief Justice has been at the forefront of this, both as a practitioner, as an active member in societies, and as a Chief Justice, 
is the emancipation of Asia and Singapore from this. So uh, Sundresh Menon comes to us not as a reporter from the hinterlands of the world to talk about uh, receptions. This is a scholar judge who represents an, a, a separate new center, if you want, of legal thinking, cosmopolitan thinking, and comparative law, which is exciting for us because we can find wisdom in law dispensed to us from other parts of the world than what we had previously been used to. That is the other reason why I'm particularly excited to give you today Chief Justice Sundrish Menon. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph. Dean Kerry Abrams, members of the faculty, students, and friends of Duke Law, distinguished guests, and most importantly, Mrs. Bernstein. Let me begin by expressing my gratitude to Dean uh, Levy for having invited me to deliver the Duke, uh, to deliver the uh, Bernstein Lecture at Duke this year and to Dean Kerry Abrams, who not only maintained the invitation, but has also extended me an extremely warm reception. It is an honor for me to speak to you on a subject of enduring importance, and especially in honor of such a distinguished member of your faculty. The task of controlling executive power, or indeed of controlling governmental power of any form, is the first project of constitutionalism. And it is a challenge that we must all confront. This task becomes especially critical in difficult or dangerous times, because it is in these situations that society sometimes countenance that which would at other times have seemed unthinkable. Take the Korematsu decision, for instance, where a majority of the Supreme Court swept up as they were in the war and its passions acquiesced to an extraordinary assertion of executive power in the name of responding to a hostile power, even though it came at the expense of the rights of an innocent minority. Korematsu has long been seen as a stain on American jurisprudence, and it was finally overruled just this year. But it is by no means unique. Across the Atlantic and in much the same context, the majority of the House of Lords in Liversidge and Anderson upheld the emergency powers vested in the British Home Secretary in 1939, which allowed him to detain all whom he had reasonable cause to subjectively believe to be of hostile origin or associations. The majority influenced by the fact that the nation was facing an existential crisis like none other in its history held that as long as the court was satisfied that the secretary had acted in good faith, he would not have to disclose the basis for his decision, nor could the court inquire into it. While states and governments are vested with immense power, which is generally exercised for the good of their societies, power needs to be controlled and managed, perhaps especially in times of threat and danger. The management and control of power, and in particular the endeavor to strike the appropriate balance between affording governments the ability to act swiftly and decisively in the public interest while providing for adequate safeguards against governmental access is an intensely difficult undertaking. There is no one model that is correct for all times and all places. How that balance is struck will depend greatly on the fears, the hopes, and the aspirations of the designers of any given constitution. In that context, the aim of my lecture today is a modest one. I hope to share with you some of the salutary lessons that we have learned from our experience in Singapore, contrasting it where appropriate with what I know of your experience, in the hope that there might be something here that is of interest to you. I plan to divide my lecture into three parts. First, I will provide a brief overview of the control of executive power as it has developed in America and in Singapore to explain how the models of our respective countries have developed are the products of our own unique historical circumstances. 
While we share a commitment to the notion of the separation of powers, we do differ in the minutiae of their application. And so in the second part of my lecture, I will examine how the control of executive powers achieved to a significant degree through some mechanisms for intra-branch control in the Singapore Constitution. These involve, among other things, insulating pockets of executive power from the political center of the executive in order to preserve their apolitical nature. And secondly, dividing certain vital powers between independent centers of executive power. Both these forms of intra-branch checks, however, do not obviate the need for judicial review, the exercise of which raises fundamental questions as to the proper conception of the judicial role. And so in the third part of my lecture, I will discuss the position in Singapore where we have found that executive power can best be checked when courts eschew politics and secure a relationship of trust and respect between the three branches by recognizing and respecting the legitimate space of each. Let me begin with a brief history of the control of executive power. In medieval England, the crown exercised all powers of the state, subject only to vague limits defined by practical exigencies. Parliament and cabinet began as advisors to the king rather than as independent institutions, and they were summoned only sporadically at the king's pleasure. And while justice between subjects was administered by the royal courts and the king's parliament, this was all done expressly in the name of the throne. In the words of the great legal historian F.W. Maitland, all of the core institutions of the state were but emanations of kingly power. Over the centuries, the powers of the crown were gradually constrained as parliament grew in stature. After the rebellion, the restoration, and the glorious revolution, it was finally settled that parliament would wield supreme lawmaking authority, thus ousting the crown's personal power to make suspend or dispense with laws. The common law courts then assumed prominence as interpreters of the acts of parliament, which paved the way for an independent judiciary. Over time, the Westminster model, as it has come to be called, has been defined by a basic concept of separation of legislative, executive, and judicial power. For your founding fathers, the separation of powers was no abstract philosophical principle, but one of the preeminent inventions of prudence. Fueled by deep distrust of power and suspicion of the human nature, the strategy devised by your founding fathers was not just to separate powers between the three branches, but to do so in a way that ensured that their allocation would not be cleanly divided. By design, the powers of each of the branches are intricately connected and blended, such as to give each a measure of control over the others. It was hoped that the resulting clash of competing ambitions that this produced would incentivize each branch to keep the others in check. In a sense, the American system was deliberately designed to produce friction and conflict for its very premise is that it is only by the push and pull of opposing forces that power can be held in check. Yours is a system that demands tact, compromise, and a degree of negotiation if it is to work effectively. But sometimes this will not be forthcoming. And the result, as we have seen recently, could be spectacular log jams and even the shutdown of the federal government. It might surprise some of you, as it did me, that this was something your founding fathers were not only cognizant of, but were quite prepared to accept. James Madison wrote in Federalist 62 that the intricate division of powers in your constitution may in some instances be injurious as well as beneficial as it stymies the passage of legislation. Gridlock was a price which your founding fathers were willing to pay in order to avert what they saw as the far greater danger of the accumulation of power and the resulting beginning of tyranny. It is a price that the United States, a vast country blessed with a wealth of natural resources, a large population base, and universities that are the envy of the world, might uniquely, perhaps exceptionally, 
be able to afford. But gridlocks are utterly unthinkable to a city-state like Singapore, which has no natural resources, trades on a reputation for good governance and efficiency, and relies on this for its very survival. If the American Constitution is the product of reflection and choice, then it may be said that the Singapore Constitution, and indeed our road to independence, was the product of accident and force. Although our founding fathers were ardent anti-colonialists, they never in fact conceived of an independent existence for Singapore. When we were freed of British rule in 1963, it was in the context of safe passage to stability and prosperity by cleaving to the Federation of Malaysia. We were freed of colonial rule as a constituent state of a greater federation. But just two years later, on 9th of August 1965, we seceded from the federation by mutual agreement following deep and irreconcilable political and economic differences with the federal government in Kuala Lumpur. That left us bereft in the world with no easy route to survival and stability, let alone significance or influence. Singapore's tiny scale and immense vulnerability is probably difficult for an American audience to identify with. But let me provide you with a point of comparison. Singapore at the time of independence was then a small nation of just over 224 square miles or about a fifth of the size of Rhode Island. And I say at that time because we have since increased our area to 275 square miles <laughs> through intensive reclamation. And in the context of a nearly 20% increase, that's very material. We had and have no natural resources, no hinterland, and no industry. Singapore depended entirely on other nations for food, energy, and even that most basic of resources, water. We still import a fair bit of our water supply from Malaysia. Geopolitically, the position was precarious. Singapore had no military of its own. It depended heavily on the British armed forces, both for its defense and its economy. The British bases contributed over 20% of Singapore's gross national product and employed some 25,000 people, all of whom lost their jobs when the British military pulled out in 1971. And constitutionally, the situation was a mess. Before separation, the Constitution of Singapore was contained in two documents, the Federal Constitution of Malaysia and the State Constitution of Singapore. After separation, the former no longer applied to Singapore, while the latter was not designed for a sovereign nation state. It was clear that something had to be done, and so our first parliament passed two acts. The first of these enacted a series of important changes to the state constitution to make it fit for the purposes of a sovereign nation, while the second provided for the continuing legal force of a number of provisions from the federal constitution, such as those relating to fundamental liberties. In this way, the Singapore Constitution, such as it was, came to be found in three separate documents. The Singapore State Constitution, the Republic of Singapore Independence Act, and the Federation, Federal Malaysian Constitution, insofar as it was made available to Singapore. Mr. David Marshall, a prominent lawyer and the former Chief Minister of Singapore, once observed that Singapore had the untidiest and most confusing constitution that any country has started life with. But these theoretical difficulties were of little moment to a fledgling nation state on the edge struggling to survive. The exigencies of separation had produced in our founding fathers a steely streak of pragmatism. Our founding prime minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, declared that the main thing about the constitution is that it must work. He said that the constitution would be, and I quote, workmanlike with a fair spread of the powers of executive authority, checks and balances for a proper account of the use of these powers, and most important of all, ensure without major amendment the continuance of good and orderly government. For Singapore, the continuance of good and orderly government was and still is the prime directive. 
For a tiny and resource-poor country, Singapore has survived and even thrived because we have succeeded in harnessing all the resources of the nation towards the single goal of securing our people's well-being. Central to our constitutional culture, therefore, is a preference for conflict avoidance and for consensus over confrontation or contention. An example will illustrate the point. To set the context, I should explain that we have a Westminster system of parliamentary democracy under which the Prime Minister and his cabinet govern, and the President, as the non-executive head of state, must act in accordance with the advice of the cabinet on all matters save those the Constitution reserves to her discretion. With the introduction of the elected presidency, of which I will say more shortly, a raft of provisions were introduced into the Constitution to frame the powers of the President. Among these was Article 22H, which provided that the President may, in her discretion, withhold assent to a bill that provided for the circumvention or curtailment of her discretionary powers. Because of an error in drafting, the amplitude of the article appeared to embrace both constitutional as well as non-constitutional provisions when it was evidently only intended to apply to the latter, non-constitutional provisions. In July 1994, the government of the day sought to introduce a bill to amend Article 22H to make that clear. But the president informed the government that because the amendment would seemingly curtail his powers, he would exercise his discretion to veto the bill. The government, on the other hand, took the view that the president didn't have this discretion. The stage was set for an impasse. The president then said he would abide by any ruling of the courts, but the problem is we, like you, do not have the power to make hypothetical rulings. The government could have forced the issue by seeking to pass the bill to invite a veto, and so doing created a real controversy for the courts to rule upon. But it didn't do that. It chose instead to amend the Constitution to provide for the creation of a constitutional tribunal that would be empowered to give advisory opinions on questions that were submitted to it. A tribunal was duly set up. It eventually ruled in favor of the government. The president accepted the ruling, and the matter was resolved in an orderly and ultimately non-adversarial manner. Now, of course, the instinct for conflict avoidance doesn't mean that the Singapore Constitution is unconcerned with the accumulation of power. But instead, it seeks to constrain that power in two principal ways. The first is through a system of intra-branch controls, which achieves a fair spread of executive authority, in the words of Mr. Lee that I referred to just now. And the second is through a system of checks and balances, the most prominent of which is, of course, judicial review. Let me discuss each of those in turn. Beginning with intra-branch controls, a central paradox of the Westminster system of parliamentary democracy is that even though it separates the powers of the state between three branches, it also contemplates what has been famously described as the close union, the near complete fusion of executive and legislative powers. In the Westminster system, the executive power of the state is largely exercised by a cabinet of ministers drawn from the majority party in parliament. What this means, at least theoretically, is that cabinet will almost always be able to implement its policies through the passage of legislation. This is the so-called efficient secret of the English Constitution. And it may be contrasted with the American presidential system where the legislature and executive are distinct entities, each with its own democratic mandate. To check the power of the parliamentary executive, the Singapore Constitution diffuses certain powers within the executive branch by distributing it to different offices, each of which may enjoy a measure of autonomy from the cabinet. This takes place in two principal ways. The first, which I term hard diffusion, involves the creation of independent executive offices that are vested with exclusive authority over certain executive functions. And the second, which I call soft diffusion, involves the attenuation of power by giving more than one office in the executive branch a share in its exercise. To illustrate these two um, examples, I'll briefly discuss the offices of the Attorney General and, and of the elected presidency. 
First, the Attorney General. Robert Jackson, a former Attorney General of the US and later an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, once said that a prosecutor has more control over life, liberty, and reputation than any other person in America. There is perhaps some hyperbole in that statement, but it is not far off the mark. The independence of the prosecutorial function is critical because it prevents the awesome power of the state from being manipulated for partisan ends and ensures the fair application of the criminal law. In Singapore, the prosecutorial function, despite being an incident of executive power, is completely divested from the cabinet and constitutionally vested in the Attorney General, who has full power to decide all matters con concerning the institution, conduct, and termination of prosecutions. It is critical to note that under our Constitution, the Attorney General, unlike yours, is neither a member of the Cabinet nor a politician, but a professional lawyer who is appointed by the President, serves until retirement or for the duration of her term, and can only be removed for cause. The Attorney General wears two hats. First, he is the government's legal advisor, and in that role, his relationship with the government is that of attorney and client, advising and acting for the government and for the state in a range of legal matters. The second role is as the public prosecutor, and in that capacity, the Attorney General acts independently in deciding who to prosecute and what charges to bring. The vesting of prosecutorial power exclusively in the Attorney General, and this is provided for in the Constitution, is a form of hard diffusion because it places a pocket of executive power completely outside the reach of the Cabinet. The fact that the Attorney General's power over prosecution stems from an independent constitutional grant is critical to this arrangement. Our Apex Court has described the office of the Attorney General as a high constitutional office equal in status to that of the judiciary. It is a matter of settled law and practice that the Attorney General takes all prosecutorial decisions without executive interference, and his decisions are subject only to judicial review on the grounds of abuse, malice, or bad faith. The position in the United States, as I understand it, is somewhat different. At least since Watergate, Successive U.S. presidents have recognized the importance of prosecutorial independence and have established policies to avoid inappropriate conflict between the White House and the Department of Justice. But as contemporary events have revealed, it is at least an open question whether it would actually be illegal for the presidency to interfere with the prosecutorial process. The difference is that Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution vests the executive power of the United States in a President of the United States, who has the constitutional obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Unlike in Singapore, federal prosecutors derive their power not from an independent constitutional grant, but from an act of Congress, namely Section 35 of the Judiciary Act of 1789. Thus, strong proponents of a unitary executive contend that the Attorney General and the Department of Justice, which he heads, are but the hands of the President and are subject to his direct supervision and control. This extends, they would say, not only to the power to remove any office holder, but also to substitute and nullify subordinate decisions, including prosecutorial decisions made in individual cases. As against this, there are those who argue the picture is less than clear, and that reasons of history, precedent, and policy suggest that the prosecutorial function is, in fact, independent of presidential direction. Now, it is quite beyond the scope of this lecture to wade into this debate about the proper interpretation of the relevant clauses of your Constitution, nor do I think it my place to do so. But I do offer two observations. First, I suggest that it might be helpful to develop an expanded taxonomy of power. While the Trinitarian separation of legislative, executive, and judicial powers continues to be fundamental, it may well be insufficient. Given the enormous growth in the size and complexity of the modern administrative state, some have suggested that there is value in reflecting more deeply about the breadth of the functions that the executive branch performs today, and in considering whether it is necessary for some of those to be devolved to autonomous agencies or offices
that operate either outside the control of the political center of executive power or in such a way that control is attenuated. Second and relatedly, I suggest that the identification and selection of such powers as might be so devolved is one for each polity to make in the light of its own experiences and particular policy imperatives. In Singapore, aside from securing the constitutional independence of prosecutorial discretion, another example of um, an area seen as being of such importance that it has also led to changes in the allocation and distribution of executive power through the introduction of the elected presidency is the power to safeguard our national financial reserves and the integrity of the public service. And we have done this through the creation of the elected presidency, which I shall now briefly discuss. Before 1991, the presidency was, in the Westminster tradition, a largely symbolic office. In 1988, a white paper proposing the transformation of the presidency was laid before parliament. Its authors noted that at that time, the Singapore constitution granted the prime minister and the cabinet complete legal access to all the levers of power and decision making and did not incorporate some of the checks and balances that are commonly found in other nations, such as the existence of a second legislative chamber with powers of veto or delay. To address this, they proposed two changes. First, they proposed that the presidency be converted from an appointed office, um, an appointment from among eminent Singaporeans, to be uh, uh, converted from an appointed office to an elected office, which would endow the president with an independent democratic mandate, and thus the moral authority to stand up to a popularly elected government. And second, they propose that the president be granted powers to check the government's management of two key strategic national assets, namely our accumulated financial resources, uh, reserves and the public service. It was suggested that where the government sought to draw down on past reserves, and by past reserves it means reserves accumulated outside the present term of office of the government of the day, or to appoint someone to high public office, the independent concurrence of the president should be made a necessary prerequisite. The white paper described this as a two-key system in which the prime minister and cabinet will possess one key and will take the initiative. For their decision to be valid, the second key must be used, namely the president must concur. Those recommendations were largely accepted, and in 1991, the institution of the elected presidency was born. After more than two decades of fine-tuning, the elected president's custodial powers today fall into three broad categories. First, she is the fiscal guardian of Singapore's past reserves, and by virtue of that, can veto any supply bill, transaction, guarantee, or loan that the government proposes to enter into and that is likely to draw on past reserves. Second, she's the custodian for the integrity of the public service, and in that capacity exercises a veto over key public service appointments, including that of the Chief Justice and Judges, the Attorney General, and the Chairman and members of the Public Service Commission. Finally, she oversees the protection of fundamental liberties in certain areas of executive action that are not always reviewable by the other branches, in particular detentions under the Internal Security Act, which is deployed to counter terrorism. In exercising her custodial powers, the elected president acts independently. She's constitutionally barred from being a member of a political party or parliament, as well as from holding any other constitutional office. To secure her independence, her remuneration is protected during the duration of her tenure, and she may only be removed from office on stringent grounds after a rigorous process that involves all three branches of government. But independence does not mean that she acts with a free hand. The president receives the benefit of advice from a body of independent advisors known as the Council of Presidential Advisors. And in certain areas, when she acts against the advice of the council, her decision is subject to a parliamentary override at which point any difference between the president and the government must be aired and resolved in parliament. Let me offer three reflections on the elected presidency. 
First, it addresses Singapore's vulnerabilities as a small and resource-poor nation. As I've said, we're not blessed with any natural resource, but through careful stewardship, we have been able to build up substantial reserves, which enable us to weather storms and undertake initiatives for the common good. This is our patrimony, and its accumulation has only been possible because of the quality and integrity of the public service. It's therefore no exaggeration to say that these are existential to our uh, continuance as a nation. Second, the custodial role played by the elected president is one which she is uniquely qualified to play because the matters placed under her custody involve matters of political rather than of legal judgment, which are not, or at least not easily, amenable to judicial review. As the then Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Go Chok Tong, observed during the passage of the amendment bill, where the government acts unlawfully, ultra vires the constitution or the laws, one can have recourse to the courts. But our constitution doesn't provide any checks on lawful government decisions or conduct, which are accesses against the best interests of our nation. Finally, the elected presidency, which was the outcome of a careful process of institutional design, was not meant to change the fundamental structure of parliamentary democracy in Singapore but to augment it by introducing a further layer of control. Although the president enjoys a separate democratic mandate, her constitutional role is not to govern, but to counsel and restrain. She's not empowered to initiate executive actions, but may block the government's proposals insofar as they concern the national reserves and the public service. The cabinet's freedom to govern is preserved in other areas subject to the existing intra or cross-branch balances and checks in the constitution. The elected presidency is in many ways an exemplification of the point I made at the start of this lecture, which is that the model of control in each nation must be uniquely fine-tuned to suit the needs and circumstances of its people. Even today, further refinements are being made to the office as it evolves to meet our needs. Both of these offices that I've discussed represent different modalities of intra-branch control. The Independent Prosecutorial Office of the Attorney General illustrates the value of fragmenting power and withdrawing certain executive powers from political contestation. The elected president illustrates how power may be shared between institutions within the executive branch so as to produce sufficient friction and supervision without necessarily engendering a sense of rivalry. The systemic discipline that is imposed by these sorts of internal controls should not be underestimated. And although the modalities are different, the need for such particular control stems from a recognition of the special significance and nature of the affected powers. But internal constraints are not always a substitute for controls by the other branches of government which exercise powers of a different cat pedigree and therefore exercise unique forms of control. With this, let me turn to the subject of judicial review and focus in particular on what we have found to be vital to its effective exercise. Judicial review is the sharp edge that keeps government action within the limits of the law. Our constitution, like yours, does not establish an express power of judicial review. But our courts have held, in the words of our first Chief Justice, Mr. Wee Chong Jin, that all legal power has legal limits, and the rule of law demands that the courts should be able to examine the exercise of discretionary power. That statement supplies both the juridical basis as well as the normative philosophy for judicial review in Singapore. As a juridical principle, it encapsulates what my predecessor as Chief Justice, Mr. Chan Se Kyung, described extrajudicially as the principle of legality. It locates the power of judicial review in the rule of law, which, up, which holds that every exercise of executive power must be authorized by law. Like the so-called ultra vires theory of judicial review in the UK, it is built on the simple proposition that a public authority cannot act outside its powers. But with one important difference, in Singapore, unlike in the UK, it is the constitution, not parliament, which is supreme. Thus, the legality of every exercise of power is ultimately referable to the constitution, which, in the words of your Supreme Court in Marbury and Madison, 
It's emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to explicate. As a judicial philosophy, the principle of legality informs the approach that we in Singapore have taken to its judicial review. If all powers have legal limits, then it must follow that the judicial power too has constitutional limits. And what limits are these? I suggest they are to be found first and foremost in remembering that it is not the role of the judicial branch to govern or to formulate policy, but simply to say what the law is. This means, among other things, that judges declare what the law is impartially and make their decisions based on what they understand the law provides and not on their idiosyncrasies or personal preferences. It means also that the judiciary must respect the prerogatives of the other branches. Our constitution divides the powers of the state into three coordinate arms and assigns different roles to each. While it is the judiciary's role to pronounce on the legality of government action, that doesn't exalt it over the other branches. For all the branches are equal both in dignity and in their subjection to the constitution. Whether one chooses to label this as judicial deference, an attitude of judicial modesty, or a form of judicial self-restraint does not, I think, in the end, matter. What does matter is that it is founded on respect for the rule of law and the Constitution, and the way in which the Constitution has divided the exercise of state power among the various branches of the government. This manifests in a changed attitude of mind. First, it means that the courts shouldn't see themselves as antagonists whose role is to obstruct governmental action, but rather as equal partners with the other branches in the common project to promote efficient administration and good and proper governance, which the judiciary contributes to by upholding the rule of law. Second, it means that the judiciary should not be diffident about performing its constitutional role when called upon to invalidate unlawful action. If courts conceive of themselves as neutral umpires, whose role is merely, as Chief Justice Roberts has said, to call balls and strikes, then there is no need to shy away from saying what the law requires. When a court strikes down an executive action for falling outside the boundaries of an, of an enumerated power, there is no conflict between the branches because an act that is taken without proper authorization is a nullity which it is the court's duty to call out. The difference is between a paradigm of confrontation and containment informed by mutual distrust and self-preservation, and one of partnership and cooperation within a framework of governance and legality. For the rest of this lecture, I want to consider the reasons of principle that undergird this approach before offering you some prudential reasons on why I believe we have generally taken this approach. Let me start by saying what I think it means for judges to limit themselves to saying what the law means. As a starting point, it's useful to recall the words of Lord Scarman in the Duport Steeles case, where his lordship wrote, the judge's duty is to interpret and to apply the law, not to change it to meet the judge's idea of what justice requires. If the result be unjust but inevitable, the judge may say so and invite parliament to reconsider its provision, but he must not deny the statute. Unpalatable statute law may not be disregarded or rejected merely because the judge thinks it is unpalatable. Now, although that was said in the context of a case about statutory interpretation, I think it is of wider relevance because so much of the work that judges do, including in the field of judicial review, revolves around the interpretation of statutes. To be sure, it's not always clear where interpretation ends and lawmaking begins. But one useful touchstone suggested by the late Justice Scalia is this. The judge who always likes the result he, results he reaches is a bad judge. Those of us who are judges will readily identify with this. I can think of a number of cases where I wish that the law was other than what I concluded that it was, or for a different result that could be reached. But whenever I catch myself thinking in this way, I remind myself it's neither my role nor do I have the constitutional mandate to say what the law ought to be, only to say what it is. Now, in this regard, one particular and important difference between your constitution and mine lies in the subject of unenumerated rights. Your Ninth Amendment expressly provides that the enumeration in the constitution of certain rights 
shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The meaning of these words have been, has been endlessly debated, but there is no questioning their significance, particularly after their re renaissance in Griswold and Connecticut, which is undoubtedly one of the most consequential, if also not one of the most controversial Supreme Court decisions of the last 60 years. Whatever one's opinion of the decision, there is no question that it has had the effect of moving the Supreme Court to the center of the culture wars, and therefore to the center of American political life, which may not be a comfortable place for every court. The difficulty, as I see it, is that the whole purpose of the judicial process is to bring disputes to an end by determining whether the plaintiff or the defendant has prevailed. The adjudicative process, by its nature, is a rule-bound, time-limited, zero-sum game in which winners and losers are produced at the conclusion of an adversarial process. This model is well suited for the resolution of disputes over contractual entitlements, but it is manifestly unsuitable as a means for the resolution of sincere disagreements over deep matters of social conscience in which what is at stake are different and incommensurable competing conceptions of the good. The more the judiciary is resorted to for the resolution of matters of searing social controversy, the more the line between legal and political questions gets blurred, and the more likely citizens will begin to see the courts as a forum for the continuation of politics by other means. By contrast, my constitution does not have a savings clause that contemplates the possibility of unenumerated rights. It was for that reason that we have tended to be leery of going outside the confines of the text of the Constitution to find rights which petitioners have sought to assert. For instance, in a 2015 case, a plaintiff asserted that corporal punishment was a form of torture prohibited by the Constitution, even though there was no explicit prohibition against torture as such. We rejected the argument on the basis that the acts complained of did not in fact amount to torture. But we also held that even if we assumed for the sake of argument that the act in question did amount to torture, where a right cannot be found in the Constitution, whether expressly or by necessary implication, the courts do not have the right to create such a right out of whole cloth, simply because they consider it desirable. We warned that reading unenumerated rights into the Constitution would entail judges sitting as a super legislature and enacting their personal views of what is just and desirable into law, which is not only undemocratic, but also antithetical to the rule of law. There is, after all, a distinction between the rule of law and the rule of judges. I suggest that these two points, the rule of law and the nature of the judicial power in the context of our Constitution, provide cogent reasons of principle for why our courts have adopted a calibrated approach to its judicial review. A different approach can be seen in the example of India. Since a 1993 decision, appointments to the Indian Supreme Court have been determined by the so-called collegium system, under which the Chief Justice and the most senior members of the judiciary have the final say in the appointment of judges. In 2014, the Indian Parliament passed an amendment to the Indian Constitution to provide for the creation of a six-man National Judicial Appointments Council, which would have the final say in such appointments. The council was to comprise the Chief Justice, two senior members of the Supreme Court, the Union Minister for Law and Justice, and two eminent persons nominated by a committee comprising the Prime Minister, the Chief Justice, and the Leader of the Opposition. A challenge was brought and the amendment was struck down by the Indian Supreme Court by a margin of four to one on the ground that it violated the so-called basic structure of the Indian Constitution by interfering with the independence of the judiciary. A great deal has been written about the doctrinal and historical merits of the decision, and I don't want to add to that today, save to make two observations. The first is that to many, this would have been a surprising result because it meant that a bill passed by more than two-thirds of the elected representatives of the people that was ratified by more than half of the state legislatures and assented to by the president of the union to amend the constitution on the subject of how the nation's judges were to be appointed 
was found by the judges to be illegal. The second concerns the suggestion and the opinions of the majority that judicial independence can only be secured by excluding the executive from the appointments process. As Justice Chalameshwa, the sole dissenting judge, pointed out, the exclusion of the executive from the appointments process not only sits uneasily with the language of Article 124, but also appears to be inconsistent with the foundational premise that the government in a democracy is by the chosen representatives of, the, of its people. The second reason for restraint arises from institutional limits of the court. However well-versed the courts might be in matters of law, it is not especially well-placed to answer all manner of social, economic, and political questions. Legislatures can commission studies, consult with elected members and their constituents, and have at their service all the powers of the civil service to research, advise, and draft laws. More importantly, they have a great deliberative chamber in which competing visions of the good may be discussed and compromises reached. Even if the result is not to everyone's satisfaction, there is at least the benefit that all who wish to speak up may do so, whether personally or through the elected representatives. These are advantages which the courts do not generally have. Unlike the legislature and the executive, the, ju the judiciary is generally constrained not only in terms of the information it receives, which is determined by the disputing parties, but also in terms of the function that it plays. The role of the judiciary is to deal with the retrospective adjudication of rights and liabilities arising out of a past event, rather than with the creation of policies to govern future conduct, even if the latter might sometimes be an inevitable consequence of the former. These differences between the judiciary and the other two branches mean that the executive and the legislature will often be better placed to deal with polycentric questions of policy. What is more, when courts decide achingly difficult socio-political questions, they effectively remove these questions from the realm of democratic decision with the advantages that it prefers. And this too might justify judicial restraint. Apart from these reasons of principle, I think there are also important prudential reasons that have informed our approach to judicial review. In Federalist 78, Alexander Hamilton described the judiciary as the least dangerous of the branches because it has neither force nor will, but merely judgment and must ultimately depend upon the aid of the executive. Both side comes out the victor. Take, for instance, President Roosevelt's ill-fated court-packing plan. The contours of the story should be familiar to most in this audience, but beginning in the spring of 1935, the Supreme Court began issuing a series of negative rulings on the President's New Deal proposals. Frustrated, President Roosevelt, flushed from a resounding victory in the election of 1936, announced his intention to pass a law granting the President the authority to appoint an additional justice for every sitting one who was over the age of 70, which would have entitled him to some six nominations. This was seen as an attempt to procure a court that would side with the New Deal, and the plan eventually failed, but not before the clash between the branches tarnished both the presidency and the court. I suggest that if the courts are respectful of the constitutional roles of the other branches, a culture of trust and respect will develop, and this will ultimately strengthen the effectiveness of the courts. Let me illustrate this with an example from Singapore in the case of Tan Seet Eng versus the Attorney General. The appellant, Mr. Tan, who was reputed to be one of the largest match, soccer match fixers in the world, had been detained under an executive order pursuant to statute with a statute which allows for detention in exceptional circumstances where the Minister for Home Affairs is satisfied that the detainee had been associated with activities of a criminal nature and the detention was in the interests of public safety, order, and peace. Mr. Tan moved for habeas corpus and challenged his detention. After studying the history and purpose of the statute, we decided that detention was only permit permitted for activities of a sufficiently serious nature which were harmful to public order within Singapore. The minister's grounds for Mr. Tan's detention were brief and did not disclose how his activities had caused harm in Singapore. Therefore, we ordered that Mr. Tan be freed. In the wake of the decision, the Ministry of Home Affairs released Mr. Tan and said in a statement that it would study the judgment carefully. 
A few days later, Mr. Tan was detained once again, this time with detailed grounds justifying that his conduct would, would cause harm of a sufficiently serious nature within Singapore. The Ministry of Home Affairs clarified in a second statement that it respected and accepted the court's judgment, but considered that there were sufficient grounds for detention order to be reissued within the legal boundaries drawn by the court. Notably, Mr. Tan did not bring a further challenge, but what is perhaps even more striking is that a few weeks later, the ministry decided of its own motion to release three other detainees without any application having been filed by them. The ministry explained in a third statement that it had taken the initiative to review its detention orders in the light of our decision and concluded that those powers did not pass muster. Further down the line, in response to our analysis of the degree of latitude given to the minister, the government amended the re relevant statute to narrow its scope. That vignette reveals that an executive that is respectful of the judiciary and is committed to abide by the law as pronounced by it will voluntarily review its policies and adjust its conduct in the light of the guidance given, even without the necessity for a formal challenge. Building a self-regulating executive branch depends partly on governmental attitudes, but also partly on the judiciary securing the respect of the other branches through honest, competent, and independent judgment that is respectful of the constitutional prerogatives of the other branches. Let me conclude with a couple of brief thoughts. At the start of this lecture, I suggested that striking the balance between empowering governments to act decisively in the public interest on the one hand and putting in place safeguards against governmental access on the other is an intensely difficult exercise. The precise balance may vary from one polity to the next, as may its modalities of control and restraint. My aim today has been to share with you our experience. That experience has taught us in Singapore many things, but I want to leave you this afternoon with two thoughts in particular. First, the separation of powers has been and still is seen as one of humanity's great devices to control the exercise of governmental power, and that it undoubtedly is. But the separation of powers also contemplates that the branches must be allowed fully and fairly to exercise the powers they have been allocated. This calls for each branch to respect and recognize the legitimate prerogatives of the others. It is fitting here to recall these words from President George Washington's farewell address. He said, the habits of thinking in a free country should inspire caution in those entrusted with its administration to confine themselves within their respective constitutional spheres, avoiding in the exercise of the powers of one department to encroach upon another. The spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments in one and thus to create, whatever the form of government, a real despotism. Your founding fathers were persons of almost preternatural energy, imagination, and courage. And their vision of a United States that would forever and always set its face against tyranny, that is the accumulation of all powers in the same hands, is one that has inspired and continues to inspire many around the world. President Washington's concern over the need to confine each branch to its proper sphere so as to avoid tyranny remains centrally relevant even today when we live in an age in which demagoguery, ultra-nationalism, and polarization have prompted a retreat from multilateralism and seduced some into favoring the greater centralization of power. We must continue to guard against this, but not at the cost of preventing any branch from acting within its legitimate sphere, and certainly not through an expansive vision of the judicial power, which is itself subject to those same constraints and cautions. My second and final concluding thought is this. Full respect for each branch's constitutional space doesn't leave us short of tools, either to control power or to assure effective governance. In Singapore, we have endeavored to develop our own models of control that have been informed by three cardinal principles, differentiation, co-equality, and respect. Like you, we began with the traditional Trinitarian separation of powers, but we moved beyond that in our system of intra-branch intra controls by developing different systems of diffusion, hard and soft, to provide for different modalities and intensities of control, 
as best befits the particular character and importance of certain powers. And in thinking about judicial review, our approach has been informed by the belief that the branches of government are equal partners in a common venture, which is to advance the best interests of the nation, but with differentiated responsibilities. This entails mutual respect for the boundaries of all the constitutional offices, including the court's own. And it has driven our belief that judicial review is most effective when an environment of trust and respect prevails such that the other branches pay careful heed to the judiciary's views. This is not always easy to secure in practice, as the examples of Korematsu and Liversidge and Anderson have taught us. But I think it is significant today that Liversidge is remembered not for the result that was reached by the majority, but for the judicial courage of Lord Atkin, who in his lone dissent wrote that even amid the clash of arms, the laws are not silent. They may be changed, but they speak the same language in war as in peace. We do not need to be Japanese Americans living on the west coast of the United States in the shadow of Pearl Harbor, or citizens of the UK surrounded by the rubble of the Battle of Britain to feel the force and power of those words, which continue to resonate so many decades later. Lord Atkin was acting entirely within his proper province. I suggest he was doing nothing more than being a robust, honest, and tough umpire who called a ball out even though the crowd might have been roaring for a different result. That was the discharge of the judicial function in its highest and purest form, and history has been his vindication. The Singapore model, like our constitution and the history of our nation, is a palimpsest that betrays its unique multiplicity of influences and traditions. I harbor no illusions that it is one which all countries need nor necessarily can emulate. Ultimately, the particular constitutional arrangement that comes to prevail in a country will be a product of its own peculiar history, its complexities, even its contradictions, and its emotional and institutional traditions. In sharing the Singapore story with you, my modest intention has been to share some of our experience and therefore to contribute to the transcontinental constitutional dialogue that so enriches us all. And the continuation of such a dialogue is itself a critical statement of how we, as a community of those bound to uphold the rule of law, can and will stand together for the values of fairness, respect, and diversity, especially when faced with the noise of division, exclusion, and suspicion. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, 